everyone. Hi, this is Nishant Malhotra from The Middle Road. The Middle Road, today I'm with Nal Kabadia. It's a very exciting podcast. We'll be talking about art and culture, specifically with respect to India. But there'll be a bit about discussion from the global perspective. Before I start, I'll just give you a brief background of what The Middle Road is about. The Middle Road is a thought leader upskilling platform within the social impact space. The platform blends media and edtech to promote affordable quality higher education. It has publications, podcasts, online courses, videos. It's a product-driven company wherein you can access everything on the portal of the Middle Road. But there is a lot of courses and a lot of material is free. So just register and access a lot of courses, online courses, for example, macroeconomics and microeconomics. And even an introduction to valuation is free now. Otherwise, you can subscribe and access uh, the whole material, including a lot of publications and uh, a couple of uh, online courses. And you can also buy a couple of standalone courses and advertise on the middle road. So advertising option is uh, to vetted entities or actors within the, within the global arena, specifically within the social impact space. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the middle road podcast. Today, I, Nishan Malhotra, your host. I'm delighted to have Mr. Mrinal Kabadia, a connoisseur of art and history, who has a particular interest in chronicling history of Mumbai. I had the opportunity to actually visit personally one of the workshops which uh, Mrinal was taking. And let me tell you, I was very impressed. I was very impressed by his enthusiasm and his knowledge. And, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to have you for a podcast. Mrinal, a very, very warm welcome to the Middle Road. Thank you, Nishant. You know, I think uh, I, I, you know, I thank you for all the words you use, and you know, the uh, all the positive um, um, outlay that you put forth for me. But I would say that you know, I went through some of your own work, and you yourself are doing some amazing stuff. You know, it's quite an impressive uh, body that you've already put together with your podcast. So there's this, you know, it's it's uh, it's great to connect with you. I'm so glad you could make it to the exhibition, so you had a chance to see uh, somewhat. You know, to some extent, uh, what, what it what it is I do in, within this space, and uh, yeah, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Sure, uh, I mean, it's a huge motivating factor, and I think what you're doing is very impressive. Is like you're taking you've taken a hobby and you've developed and cultivated to a new level. I think this is a very strong message. One should be connected to the roots, and art and culture is remains very important for any civilization or any economy. I'll give you a brief introduction. Uh, Mr. Kabadia is an alumnus of University of Michigan and Arbor, US. He's a fellow alum. Even I'm an alum of uh, University of Michigan and Arbor. And he has spent years studying and researching various aspects of Indian art and history. Even while studying to be an industrial engineer, Mirnal always had an interest in history and archaeology. Having nearly completed a minor degree in classical European archaeology at University of Michigan and Arbor. Now, this is something very interesting in the US because you could go and you have a plethora of different subject or themes which you can study. So this is a great option, which you you know you can go to Western universities, and of course, there are other also universities around the world. And I think this is a splendid option for people to pursue what they're really interested, the their hobbies or what they're really passionate about, apart from the main curriculum which they want to pursue. Now, after a short stint as a business management consultant. He's now involved across different business verticals, including film production. And as of 2020, formalized his interest in history by founding the Vis India Visual Art Archive, a collection of antique art and images that endeavors to link visuals through history and vice versa. Through independent research, the archive is currently focused on chronicle works from the erstwhile Bombay presidency. His passion for exploring the rich cultural heritage of Mumbai has led him to undertake several projects and initiatives aimed at preserving and promoting the city's history. Now, through his extensive knowledge and research, Mrinal has developed a deep understanding of the evolution of Mumbai from his early days as a fishing village to his present day status as one of the India's most vibrant and dynamic cities. Mumbai still remains uh, as a commercial capital of India. His work provides invaluable insights into city's rich cultural, social, and economic history and offers a unique perspective on various factors that have shaped its growth and development over time. 
Mrinal is the founder of India Visual Art Archive, which I've already spoken about, and we'll be talking today about his uh, fascinating work. Mrinal, of course, you know, you have uh, been sort of an inspiration and a motivation for others, and that's the reason why I want to highlight your work. So today's uh, uh, chat predominantly will be, you know, talking about your interest in art, culture, and heritage as a hobby and work in this space. So before we ch uh, chat about your interest in history, how did your interest in history evolve? Now you could talk about your education at Michigan, uh, about your minor subjects, and um, we'll also come to how your academic learning created, uh, you know, enabled you your work, what you're doing today. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, you know, uh, I, I will start by saying that, again, I am in this history space uh, currently, but in uh, the, the, the funny thing for me is for, for me myself, and I look back, I never enjoyed history so much in school. I don't know if it was to do with, you know, the way the subject was presented or the way the teachers were or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, but just just looking back, you know, it never some it's never something that fascinated me. Um, I think what really got me started at, at a very, you know, in, in a very small way it, into this direction is, is like you said, you know, when, when I was at the University of Michigan, uh, that was a great beginning for me because, again, I think you said something about, you know, it's a it's it, again, the Western curriculum, uh, at least the US curriculum is, is, is a great way to explore uh, passions that you already have. But for me, it was a little more than that. It was actually a passion I didn't know I yet had, you know, it was uh, something I came into uh, because, uh, again, uh, uh, like, you know, and like, I'm sure a lot of the listeners, know, um, it's about uh, uh, picking subjects within um, social sciences and humanities and uh, other electives. And, um, you know, it, it was anthropology and archaeology that I just stumbled into because it was almost like a requirement to do something else other than the core engineering subjects. And I realized I liked it so much, you know, the subject, maybe it was, again, it was just the way it was taught or the way it was presented. But I remember now that I look back, it's been about a decade, a little over a decade. But uh, now that I look back at uh, work and I really thrived in that kind of, um, you know, space. And, and I realized that this is something I really like. And then I began to pursue uh, a minor degree. I went, I started to move towards uh, doing a minor degree, achieving one. Um, and in the end, I didn't end up completing it because since I was doing classical European archaeology, they required me to go to either Greece or Italy to complete um, my minor. And uh, I think at that time, again, you know, I was already studying abroad. And so uh, a semester of studying abroad from studying abroad would be a bit much. Maybe, you know, <laughs> my parents wouldn't be able to take it at the time. I didn't, uh, I, I just decided, you know, I'll just continue um, this in a different way uh, going forward. So uh, again, you know, uh, through whatever reasons, I came back to Bombay. Uh, like you've already mentioned, you know, I worked within the fields of engineering and business management consultancy until I joined our family business. And again, we, you know, we, we, we do different things and, you know, there's one particular family business that when I joined, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something to do with textile machinery. And we mostly work with uh, a lot of these small, at least we used to traditionally, it's evolved a bit more. We work with a lot of these small German textile towns. And I would just, you know, walk around the streets at the end of the day, because you know uh, factories close at a certain, uh, at least my training would close at a certain time. I would see these small antique shops, and I just walk in casually, and I'd love the imagery. I I really enjoyed looking through some of the imagery. And if one of the German shopkeepers, if they spoke a little English, they would try and you know um, talk a little more about it. And I ended up starting to you know uh, look into uh, bits of India-based visuals that were created in Europe, mostly the UK, but also in Western Europe. And that's when the history uh, interest started, you know, kind of colliding with this interest in, I, I, you can say art to some extent, but a, a lot of it is just visual history and visual imagery. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Of course, you missed out to great places. I mean, Italy and Greece, that would have been a fabulous thing. But how did, uh, did Indiana Jones uh, and the Lost Ark, did it have a sort of a motivating factor for you to, uh, you know, go into archaeology? Because that movie had a huge influence on me uh, when I saw it. The whole Indiana Jones series had had a huge influence in me, but I just wanted to check that uh, you know small small things sometimes motivate you to take your surroundings. Right? right? No, absolutely. That was very very formative for me in this space. I'm sure again if I, I can't maybe pinpoint it exactly, but I'm pretty sure that's the reason I did the archaeology course to begin with. For me, you know how history, um, of course archaeology, but I, I you know when I was really young and I 
you say, I would watch Indiana Jones. I didn't really know what archaeology was at the time. Um, but that colliding with treasure hunts, you know, I, I think there's no child's imagination that can't spark. So that really was, and, and, and it stayed with me. I think for most, it kind of withers away. But maybe it was just, you know, too strong uh, uh, a motivation somewhere inside. And it really stayed with me. So, yes, it was quite formative for me. Uh, just let me correct myself here. Uh, the movie, the name of the movie was Raiders of the Lost Earth. Exactly. Yeah, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Earth. Yeah, added up later on in the series. Absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. Now, just to sort of, you know, take a different turn. This movie is actually one of the uh, culturally very important in America, and uh, this sort of changed the way action was also portrayed. So, this has been a game changer movie in many aspects. Right. Yeah, but do continue. Right. I really liked what you talked about in America. There are so many, you can so many take so many things which actually define your multifacets or your multiple, you know, dimensional personality where you can hone, at least in a university like, uh, in specifically in America, or a lot of uh, Western universities or big universities, uh, you know, even in Asia and globally. Right. No, no, absolutely. So, you know, again, I when I came back to Bombay, um, after you know all, all that I studied and you know and, and, and all the stints I went through, I did feel a gap you know in my um, yeah I missed that subject. I wanted to have some link and relation with it. So uh, in Bombay again, there's very very little. There's very few avenues at least six seven eight years ago to try and pursue um, a field like this. And um, somehow I ended up finding out about um, this one Sunday afternoon course. It it required me to do a beginner's archaeology to get introduced to archaeology in India and uh, beginner's archaeology on Sunday afternoons for a whole year. And that was again, you know, back then for me, it was a big commitment, but I really, really was keen on uh, taking that up. And I must credit uh, Dr. Kurush Dalal, he's the professor in Bombay who set up this whole uh, program for the University of Mumbai. And um, the funny thing is, you know, archaeology was, and, and many other subjects, of course, uh, they were considered within a, a, a department in the University of Mumbai and called the CEMS, which is the Center for Extramural Studies. So extramural means outside the walls. You know, it was literally like uh, one of those uh, subjects that didn't, they didn't give that much importance. They still don't to a large extent. But, you know, um, that's, that's just how I ended up continuing archaeology in some form when I came back. And uh, again, you know, we can get into uh, how I evolved this and the imagery into what I do today, um, if you'd like me to, you know, if you'd like me to uh, get a little more into that at some point. Sure, sure, of course, uh, you're free. I was actually, you know, I attended your exhibition in Mumbai, where you narrated the history of Mumbai between 1700 and 1800 at the Asiatic Society in Mo Mumbai, Asia, uh, India. That was, uh, I think, very impressive. Uh, I was very impressed by your knowledge and your enthusiasm and the way you actually took the crowd and you explained the various uh, nitty gritties, the intricacies involved with the whole idea. So you could, you know, chat about what you really wanted to chat and take us through uh, this aspect, uh, specifically about the exhibition where you can talk about. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think, you know, the best would be to first bridge the gap between, you know, how I got from um, the archaeology in Bombay and, you know, seeing these little bits of imagery into the yeah. art history of Bombay. Um, so, uh, you know, it really, again, again, I had these small skirmishes over the years with uh, these small imagery shops that I would, you know, uh, see images in. I had some idea about what they were like and, um, you know, it was a small collection at the time and it didn't really, it wasn't coherent, let's put it that way. There was nothing, you know, binding it all together. It was just bits of things that I really enjoyed. But, you know, um, one thing that happened with regards to my collecting, I did a trip to the UK just a few months before uh, COVID. Uh, again, you know, it was just a, uh, an, an impromptu trip and I spent a week just meeting all sorts of uh, dealers, in, antiquarian dealers. And uh, again, in, in, in India, it's not a very well-known profession, but in the West, it's especially in, uh, the, in Western Europe and, and the UK, and to a large extent in North America also, it's, it's, it's an old profession. It's been uh, intergenerationally, uh, you know, it's been cultivated. So uh, I met a lot of these dealers who are in this space. I would sort of, you know, just stay in touch with them over the next few months. And then when COVID hit, uh, what ended up happening is I got back in, the, back in touch with a lot of them because, again, I had a lot of time on my hands. And uh, I would sort of just ask them, you know, is there anything coming on India, you know, into the market? And what was happening at the time, which I didn't realize is happening, is that, um, you know, there's a lot of these uh, aristocratic homes in the UK. 
and uh, you know there's there's all sorts of shapes and sizes of manor houses and land holdings and um, there if someone has an estate and they cannot keep up with taxes they have the option of um, uh, surrendering their property and land to the UK government and it's uh, all merged with the National Trust which sort of develops it for tourism culture and etc but uh, they're absolved of all the debt and so what ended up happening at this time is because a lot of the artwork related to uh, India is from British India a lot of antique artwork I'm sorry related to India is from British India a lot of these artworks started coming into the market because a lot of these uh, estates couldn't keep up with their taxes at the time and so suddenly there was an influx of uh, you know material that was coming in and that's when I be really began uh, my collecting so it was just those two years the two peak years of COVID it worked well for me uh, and not just from the collecting point of view also from uh, the uh, research point of view because you know it was a it was a budding interest that I, I, I had sort of honed already uh, where I was getting into uh, you know Bombay history and I, I knew some amount by then but during COVID you know it was literally night after night after night I just read 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 as many first-hand records many second-hand records which are white papers and such that were written later so just just becoming this you know just like a sponge it just came naturally to me and I just enjoyed reading a lot of this so as I'd read I'd kind of figure okay now in terms of uh, visuals this is what I uh, should be looking for this is what I have this is what I don't have so you know the collection and the research just kept bouncing off each other so it's it's sort of reached this point right now where both are in, in, in a good space and of course it's ever growing you can't there's no end to any of this and uh, you know I'm, I'm still enjoying this journey it's still an ongoing journey uh, if also would you like to say how did you come up uh, with this particular dates is like from the 1700 to the 1800 was it like part of uh, a bigger plan or is just that you're fixated on a certain point in time with the Mumbai history you know, take us uh, through the 1700 and the 1800 uh, part. It's basically, I just wanted to check up. Is it uh, that did that really excite you? Was that particular period really something which is really uh, close to your heart? Or is it like of really heritage? It's like something a very important period. Yeah, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to sound very pedantic or anything. But, you know, I think for most of us, a, a, a larger searching question generally that comes up at whatever point of time in life is you know where we come from and for me uh, again it, it, it's a much grosser way but it somehow got to me as to uh, it came to me as to you know where, where, where does Bombay come from but how did Bombay end up where we're you know uh, where it's at today and um, again you know when we speak of some of the great cities of India like Delhi for example and such you know they're so old and so uh, there's so much antiquity within it but Bombay is a young city as such it, it was literally nothing before the uh, Portuguese or the British came by it was just these you know uh, mosquito infested swamplands where no one wanted to set foot on mortality rate was over 50 to 70 percent uh, within you, one wouldn't ex be expected to live more than uh, two years uh, you know, just just living on these islands at, in, in, in the late 1600s. So uh, that's generally how it was described. Uh, again, so, so we, uh, you know, when I look back into Bombay history, it's very short in that sense, in a larger sense, because it's not more than three to 350 to 400 years old. And, uh, and, and again, all this coins. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. When you talk about history, the two most oldest and the most important cities in India would be Delhi and Calcutta, right? According uh, to you. No, uh, again, uh, you know, I I haven't done enough of uh, my own studies in medieval Indian history. But again, Calcutta also was a uh, was a British city. It was in fact a British. Uh, uh, I think it was Charnock. I think it was Job Charnock that uh, founded Calcutta uh, the the way we know of it today. Um, so even I think that was also around the mid 1600s. Uh, and Bombay was again uh, taken from the Portuguese by the British in. The 1660s. So um, again, these are that way relatively younger cities. Um, no, so again, you know, the time that since the time since Bombay has been around, uh, uh, visual visuals have been around with us. You know, in terms of uh, printmaking. Um, so we, there has been a visual repository uh, that shows the evolution of Bombay over time. And again, my collection. Now I can look at it back retroactively and uh, you know, extrapolate a bit, but uh, it, it sort of uh, tries to, at least with the exhibitions and the talks I do and such, it tries to tell a, st 
the, the, the work tries to tell the story of uh, how Bombay evolved over time. So again, you know, from the kind of, uh, you know, no man's land that it was in the 1700s, you can say it had become somewhat of a small trading outpost. Um, it, it was still nowhere near any sort of prominence. It was, it barely featured on maps. It was featured as sometimes, it was written as sometimes as being in Braz, near Brazil, and sometimes people thought it was in Africa. And uh, again, you know, we must, we must remember that a lot of, the, uh, uh, not a lot of it, all of it is a European centric view of the world and of India and of Bombay. So in fact, even if you look at a world map today, Europe is at the center of it. So, you know, that's, that's just how it was all created at the time. And that's, that's how you know, we've reached where we're at, we're at today. But, the main reasons Bombay ended up finally developing was one, it had a very deep natural harbor. So uh, shipping at the time was very important. Bombay was well positioned in the sense that it was in the middle of what, you know, we call India today. There was no concept of India then, but uh, it was somewhere in the middle and on the Western coast. So very accessible to the European side. And um, a deep natural harbor means, you know, the ships, uh, larger ships can come more in. And so uh, smaller ships can, uh, disembark and embark quicker. Um, they can turn around quicker. So basically it's, you know, how efficient a port can be, it depends on the depth of the harbor. So that's one of the reasons that Bombay f first was selected and began to develop. And it really developed eventually in the 1800s because of uh, the cotton trade that came in and out of it. It was actually also opium, but today now in, in our sanitized world, we sort of kind of disregard the opium side of trade, which was also quite substantial. But um, um, Bombay cotton traders became extremely wealthy. And uh, that's when, uh, and this is again the mid 1800s. And uh, during the 1860s is when uh, this cotton trade really included the trade embargo on uh, cotton that comes from America. So, uh, you know, like we discussed a little before, uh, you know, a, a lot of these reclamation projects and, you know, real development happened because of all this influx of cotton money that had come in. Mm -hmm. So that was one of those big turning points for Bombay in the mid 1800s. And again, you know, there was no looking back from there because again, Bombay was developed as a primarily or, or almost exclusively a trading city. Uh, so, you know, it, it attracted mostly uh, people of that mentality and you know, of the trading mentality. And, you know, when you have that in your blood, you sort of, you know, you're always looking for that profit and you're always looking for business gains. And uh, so Bombay prospered in a monetary sense uh, to a large extent, and it just grew from there. So it's good you, you know, brought about a bit of uh, how the sort of connection with British and Portuguese. As a matter of fact, I went to Fort Kochi, and uh, I think that's one of the one of the oldest i'm not sure i don't remember but it's it's also connected i think portuguese came there it's one of the oldest forts in india i'm not sure but somewhere close to that so there was another fort there would you like to sort of speak anything between 1700 and 1800 which you'd like to share with an audience you think which you have not shared right now or would you sure within the century of the 1700s yeah, yeah. that's where you actually took the exhibition and I thought if you want to sort of right. do a small journey, whichever way you feel is best. I, I could touch base on that a little bit, sure. So the thing is, uh, at least when it comes to the Bombay story, uh, in the 1770s to 1780s is around the time where there was some sort of political stability that was coming into Bombay. So um, the thing is, before that, there were all sorts of other uh, European powers and even Indian powers, you know, to some extent, the Marathas were uh, one of the big uh, uh, dominant forces in the area at the time. And they were constantly knocking on the door of taking Bombay away from the British. Uh, in the 1750s, there was this very real fear that when France and England were fighting the Seven Year War, um, that France would attack Bombay from Pondicherry. And, uh, you know, so, so in, in fact, the funny thing is, places like the Oval Medan, you know, there was, there was an oval shape that, that already existed there before. And uh, to some extent, it might have been formed that way so that there could be an artillery base in case the French attack in the 1750s from that point. So, you know, it's small, small things like that, that still survive with us in very different ways and different reasons. So again, by the 1770s, all the local uh, powers around had been conquered. And uh, where I began that exhibition that you're speaking about, is you know it's sort of uh, because of the political stability it began to attract a small trickle of artists that would start coming in it's mostly again um, 
to take a step back in terms of artistry in India, uh, the thing is, we, you know, today company school paintings, for example, are extremely well known, thought of, revered. There's a lot of literature about it and such. Uh, the thing is, when the, when, when the East India Company officers, or at least the higher ups would first come to India, they would look around and they would figure that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the Mughals that are, you know, the all powerful, the almighty, the absolute sovereign powers in the area. And, uh, and of course, there were a lot of local powers. And then they would see that, you know, the real powers are the ones that are, the, uh, that are patronizing the arts. So when they finally came to their being, the company, the East India Company wanted to themselves be the patrons of art in India. So that's when the company school painting, uh, painting started to be formed. Um, so anyway, so uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to Bombay, because it was primarily a trading and business hub, it didn't attract that many patrons of the arts. So as a result, Bombay didn't attract too many professional artists. It was mostly amateur artists. And here, when we say amateur, the context is that people who didn't make their living uh, from artistry. So amateur artists might be extremely talented also, but they just it was just their secondary kind of, uh, not professional, like a hobby, but something that they do on the side that they enjoy and such. So we have artists coming in at that time. And again, my collection has some of those artworks with me. And those are some of the things that I wanted to display um, starting from that 1760s to 1770s period. And do you think that's one of the most important periods in Mumbai history? That's sort of the uh, history where you'll define, you know, if you look back in time, that's the most important century of for the, you know, Mumbai anyway does not have a huge history, but that will be a pivotal point for uh, the genesis of Mumbai, as you know today. I think, in, in, yeah, maybe you can say genesis is the right word, I think. I think it's not the pivotal moment and it's not the pivotal uh, decade or century yet, but it's the genesis of the, because, you know, once you have that stability, it's when you can start building on carefully and slowly. And again, you know, when we look back, I don't think the company, East India Company really had all of this in mind. They didn't think Bombay would become what it has today. But, uh, you know, they, they were building on the trade that they had set up and protected. I wouldn't even say they hadn't, uh, they, they had set it up and they had protected it. They hadn't even developed it because there was so much instability till up to this time. So uh, then it started to grow from there. So you can say it's the genesis for sure. And tell me, Viral, I want to ask a personal question. I was very impressed when you, you know, you put everything together. And how many hours of work did it really come to? I mean, that's a very good question. You know, when you put up an exhibition, you can talk about here for everybody, whether you are in any country, how many hours it takes and what sort of, uh, you know, uh, hindrances or what were the sort of bottlenecks which you faced and how you came over it? That could be a one side question uh, when, as we discuss your things. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, in terms of actually putting together or at least researching and um, just reading up all of this, you know, which, which will help me later put it together. In general, I would say it took me, uh, I think, many months and many nights uh, uh, of continuous reading for many months during COVID, where I would learn a lot about, you know, because for me, it was a brand new subject, you know, I didn't study it in school, I didn't study it in college, I didn't study it after college, it was a little even after that, it was during COVID, where for that one year, I really, but I deep dove into it. But you know, again, with, with respect to the exhibition, I think that's what you're talking about. With respect to the exhibition, um, because I already had a lot of this information at hand, it, I, I think, Again, uh, because I'm involved in other uh, ventures and you know other other projects, const uh, which which have no overlap with this particular one, um, I, I would try and dedicate one one day a week for two months uh, to a project like this. So I would say that many you know you could do the math like that means seven to eight to ten hours a day for uh, two months, uh, putting it all together. And, you know, again, it, it's, it's not just that because it's an art exhibition, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with, you know, getting the works also ready for display. Because since it's a private collection, I just keep them as I want. And I'm very careful because I'm, I'm really passionate about them. So I keep everything in archival and asset free materials, uh, whether it's plastic or whether it's boards or mounts or uh, frames. But uh, to get them exhibition ready is another task. So uh, that, that also took up a lot of time. It's very interesting. You know, for now, there's another exhibition which you do, which you did, and this is what I was thinking is like, we can, you know, go and uh, talk about the next event which you have done. 
now here you you have already talked about uh, you know the the whole sort of the the genesis of mm -hmm. uh, the making of mumbai we also conducted a session with the maritime mumbai museum society of uh, mumbai and the chhatrapati shivaji maharaj vastu sangrahalay mm -hmm. now where you are tracing the history of mumbai from hippotenusa to bombay and to finally bombay now the, this is a very sort of critical phase now when you do share the history you could talk about you now over two centuries and do a deep dive yeah sure sure so um you know i mean i think i can just continue from where i left off 1700s where you know by this time uh what the whole town of bombay was within a fort so it was a, it was a fortified area in the southern part of the island and it's again it's the area that is officially not even unofficially but officially known as fort even today so that fort area is actually where the fort of bombay was and that was the entire town of bombay and everything that's that's all that bombay was so you know areas for example in the area where i grew up it's it's an area called kemscon and bombay for listeners maybe they don't know but it's about let's say 2 kilometers from the fort area that was a suburb of bombay at the time and that was uh, you know again uh, bombay was quite a nice tropical jungle for a bit, since since i guess uh, you know since post, uh, since forever of course um, since the islands were even formed and you know there were always skirmishes that the british would record with uh, you know they would have with uh, poisonous snakes and tigers and hyenas and all sorts of you know wild wild animals all over so that that's what you know the situation of bombay was um it was all centered around just the shipping trade but by the 1800s uh, the first half of the 1800s uh, you know there was a, quite a growth spurt in terms of the population that was coming in uh, what the british called native town the native town was the areas that you know that we call um bhuleshwar and mamadali road today and mumma devi and kalba devi and you know all all of those areas the the central part of bombay or at least some of the central part of bombay uh, was was uh, called as native town then that began to really grow um, in terms of population and again trade was steadily and uh, very very slowly and steadily increasing but um the the, the real change eventually happened you know in again uh, to take a step back within the 18 mid 1800s there were steps that it took to reach that change for example in the 1840s is when two revolutionary technologies came in which unbelievably increased uh, transportation and communication so one was the steam engine because until now if you have ships sailing back and forth from europe to india to the indian subcontinent it would take many months to go to do a full route because it was a trade route um now with the steamship it could take anywhere between 6 to 8 weeks and you could go you know from one place to the other which is an unbelievable change in technology that came in the other was uh, these penny postage stamps that's what they called it basically the beginning of the postal system you know to uh, communicate and to write to someone and to hear back uh, and again because these uh, these writings or these instructions or these uh, communications would go through the steamships it would go and come so much quicker than before so you know it, it wouldn't take let's say in the 1600s or 1700s also for example if there was an order passed in london by the east india company and they had to tell the people in bombay it, it would take a year for them to send that instruction for the for the people in bombay to receive it and then for them to receive back the instruction from bombay so can you imagine how uh, communication was so this changed everything it became less than 2 months to or less than 3 months to year back and you know get get the next step going but uh, the 1850s saw yet another huge uh, change in technology within bombay and i'm actually in the midst of you know uh, gathering a lot of information for this for 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 various reasons i'm trying to put up an exhibition of some of my artwork related to this right now but it's to do with the railways in bombay you know the rail railway suddenly developed and you know now transportation again within india and within uh, to for now it was within bombay but connected to you know through maharashtra eventually uh, past the western ghats that that would have that was going to completely revolutionize everything because all the cotton growing areas is uh, were in gujarat at the time again that was the biggest cotton growing area uh, back then back then and for all the cotton to go in and out of uh, you know gujarat bombay bombay gujarat and then to be shipped you know that's when the bombay cotton merchants really started making huge 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 uh, an untold wealth you know at the time um, in the 1860s 
you can say. So I mean, that, uh, uh, you know, this was the same people along with, uh, who all would, were, would be these entrepreneurs when you're talking about, more British, or you think there were some Indians also who were sort most, of- Most most of them, at least out of Bombay, were Indians. So I think Jamshed Ji, Gigi Boy was one, uh, Prem Chand, Roy Chand was another. I think uh, in terms of investments, even uh, the, the, the Sassoons had some stake in uh, a lot of the cotton mills. They weren't, I think they had, they were too big a business powerhouse, probably the biggest business family in Asia at the time. Um, but but they also had you know, youths taken. So again, they were mostly Indians. Um, and there were some British, for example, I think the the family of uh, Charles Forbes, um, I think that, that that family also was one of the wealthiest families uh, in Bombay at the time. But yes, mostly it was Indians uh, that really made their uh, fortunes. Okay, amazing. I mean, the, the you know, the way you have a sort of an encyclopedic knowledge of Mumbai, that's very interesting. So you could, you know, again, uh, go ahead and talk about where you think would be. So let me ask you this, which will be the pivotal point in Mumbai history? I'm, this is the perfect time to ask it because this is exactly where I was coming to next. So it's, it's again, you know, by now the cotton merchants had this these huge uh, gains that they'd made. And... Um, between 1861 65 like i already mentioned is when the american civil war happened and that's when you know those uh, fortunes became obscene wealth you know so for, so for example there, there is there are anecdotes today where even like you know any common person like anyone just anyone living in bombay you know they, they saw so much money in cotton that they were tearing their mattresses apart to just sell that cotton at 20 to 30 times the price that it used to be that they would have bought it at so, you know, there was just, it, it was it, just like a mania. You can say it was like an absolute mania where, you know, cotton was just being sent and sent to whatever extent possible because all the, uh, I think all the, um, um, what do you say, the, the cotton mills in Manchester and Liverpool were, were, were just dying for the influx of cotton to come in. So because they had so much production capacity by this time in the 1860s. So that's literally by 18, between 1861 and 65 is when all that wealth was made. And in 1865, when the American Civil War ended, so much of that wealth just dropped suddenly, just went bust because there was so much uh, uh, speculation in the commodity exchange trade that was going on that, uh, you know, people had over bet on um, cotton in, in, in for, the, for the many coming years. And so, you know, even it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, Jamshed Ji Ji Boy and Prem Chand Roy Chand and all the biggest, uh, or, or the biggest, uh, what do you say, the, the, not the biggest, the wealthiest families at the time. It's like the, it's like saying today the Tatas and the Yambanis would go bankrupt overnight. You know, that's what happened at the time. Literally, like they just uh, lost a lot of their wealth. And that's when a lot of these reclamation projects that they had invested in, because everyone was counting on the fact that because there's so much wealth coming in and so much population coming in, and also at the time, the fort walls, the fort of Bombay, the fort walls were all raised down. So you know, because the fort was demolished, because there was no need to really protect themselves anymore, all the land around the fort started becoming very valuable. And uh, that's where reclamation projects started. So there could be more land made available for, when, for people when they come in. So uh, you know, all, all these projects went bust also. So Bombay stagnated a little bit after. But you, but, but you can say that it, there was no stopping it in the longer run. If let's talk about Chapati, you know, there are some very significant events or developments that have shaped uh, Mumbai's history. Mm -hmm. What would the history be behind the iconic uh, Chapati in Marine Drive? Right. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, the word Chapati itself, you know, today when we talk about Chapati, again, to listeners who are not uh, fully connected with Bombay or may not be aware, Chopati today is almost synonymous with beach when we say it in Bombay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's literally like the two words are used interchangeably. But actually speaking, Chopati, the word is it comes from the the word the two words chow pati. So in Marathi it means char pati, uh, which means four channels. And you know what that refers to is uh, it. it, it Again, uh, in, a, in a much more pristine time, there were four channels uh, that flowed in and out of the, uh, the the Arabian Sea at this point or this area, and um, you know it just later it it, it stayed with us in um, living memory in the form of this word. You know, we we, we don't uh, we don't have visuals that show it. Uh, it's it's it, it was long gone before you know uh, visuals of Bombay had begun to appear in the 1600s and 1700s. 
but uh, it's it's something that stayed with us. So Chopati is known in antiquity, of course, through different words and different names and such. Um, and again, sorry, just a quick thing to uh, um, listeners that and viewers that may not know this, but Chopati is that you could say about a, less than a kilometer, you could say about half a kilometer from the fort area of Bombay. So it's just a little outside of what was the fort area. And today, it it's, it lines the iconic marine drive. That's what uh, Bombay, you know, when, when, when one Google searches Bombay images, that's the first thing one sees. But um, uh, what Chopati was known for in antiquity, let's say about um, somewhere between 1,000 and 900 years ago, um, it was actually the docking point for pilgrims that would come from other parts of Western India, because in about the, again, we don't know the exact date, somewhere between the 10th and 12th century AD, there was a dynasty. Now, again, some say it was the Shilaharas from the south, that was, you know, there was some other dynasty, but but some, uh, uh, some, some rulers and some kings, they patronized one part of Malabar Hill. And um, because there was a fresh water tank right next to the sea, which has, uh, you know, portable water, it's drinkable water, and no one knows where the source of that water is. So it's magical in that sense, you know, so a thousand years ago, that was just, it just seemed like absolute magic. So because of that, there was a temple complex that was built, which was very sacred. And so pilgrims would come, they would dock at Chopati, they would take a, a small little walk through um, an area, um, uh, a, a steep climb, and then reach this part of Malabar Hill. Uh, which is today called the Ban Ganga tank, Temple Tank Complex. Um, again, the, the road that they would take was, uh, again, it was so steep, it was like a ladder or like a CD. And that road ended up being known as Siri Road because Siri and CD, you know, that's just how the world evolved. And today, Siri Road is one of the main uh, primary roads of in, within Madhabar Hill. So um, that's, that's again, you know, where the origins of um, Chopati somewhat, you know, they, 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 there's mentions of it in different um, text again, you can get into more details if needed. But um, so, so again, um, uh, by the time the British came in, so when the Portuguese came in, uh, they sort of, um, you know, cannoned some of these original temples in the temple tank complex. So, so in terms, because, and again, they came with this whole impetus of Catholicism, the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there was a dip in terms of pilgrims that would visit because there was, uh, you know, there was religious obstruction and such. And, you know, it was not a very welcome situation for those 100 and 100 plus years that the Portuguese were in Bombay. But by the 1660s, when the British came, um, okay, religious problems, you know, it, it again became some place of prominence. The, the temples were rebuilt, the, uh, the Bank of the Temples were rebuilt, and Chopati again became somewhat of a, um, um, uh, what do you say, um, a place of relevance. By the early 1900s, we'll just jump ahead a little, just so we can wrap up this little bit about Chopati, but uh, Chopati at the time used to be um, where to the, what we call marine lines today is approximately where the beach used to be. So uh, in the 19... 20s, uh, sorry, the decade of the 1910s is when a lot of uh, reclamation projects sort of built Marine Drive because Marine Drive was sort of uh, re uh, uh, taken from the sea and uh, the beach was also kind of shifted a little ahead. So what we see today is not the original position, but it maintains a similar st uh, shape, you know, the semicircular shape. So, you know, we still think it's the same, but it's, 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 it's how it's evolved. And today it's the iconic, uh, you know, look and view of Bombay you know, as one, as one comes to Bombay. Very impressive. You actually also talked about uh, marine lines. And so the Kalaba, the Kalaba beach to the lines is where the sky, Mumbai skyline comes in, right? Uh, that's a, that's a very lovely uh, ride. Am I, am I correct here? So uh, the thing is Kolaba is still uh, more south to uh, this area. So where, uh, you know, where marine drive kind of caps off is somewhere around the place where Nariman point starts. And actually, in terms of, uh, let's say, if one was to see a map of Bombay, or one was to, uh, you know, see uh, this this part of the city from, let's say, a far off point, like on Malabar Hill, it would look like it's one continuous stretch. And so, you know, it does look like the skyline is all, you know, um, 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 uh, that way. But that's that's not necessarily the case. You know, that's, uh, again, they, they're two different, you know, they, they, there's a different depth to Kulaba and where Marine Drive is at. But of course, like you know now, the, the skyline has changed so much because central Bombay is where the real skyline is developing, you know, the lower Parel areas and basically all the old cotton mill lands, uh, you know, which had that kind of what we say FSI today, 
in, uh, to build you know, such towering structures. Uh, these are the only large parcels of land in Bombay that could have been amalgamated to build at the height that uh, you know, they have today. Yeah, good. You have you actually shared another very important aspect, and we can you know talk about it about the property market. But you talked about Malabar Hill. That's also a great place. But I think you know we uh, we talked a lot about uh, Mumbai. So just come to this question: How did the word Mumbai come in? So they, I think you have a fascinating history behind it, right? Right, right. Again, you know, um, as I would read a lot of these uh, records over, let's say, the COVID months and such, it would constantly been uh, be reiterated that um, Bombay comes from uh, the Portuguese word Bombaya which means uh, good bay. So basically, uh, Bom, uh, Bom, Bombay Island would have been the island of good bay. But, uh, you know, uh, the deeper I looked into it, there were uh, some anomalies. So for example, again, this is through, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit academic, but there are some linguistics researchers who uh, know old Portuguese, language old Portuguese. And apparently, Bombay uh, grammatically does not make sense because one is masculine and one is feminine. So, you know, it would have been Boa Bahia instead of Bomb Bahia. So the good bay, if it had to be said out in old Portuguese, it would be Boa Bahia. So again, that may, first of all, that makes no sense. And um, again, other linguistic experts that I spoke to, they, when they would talk about the Portuguese word for Bombay, which was not even Bomb Bahia, it was Bomb Baim. So it's B-O-M-B-A-I-M. -B -B what they told me is in Portuguese, even today, and in general, in any coastal communities all over the world, you know, there's always strong nasal intonations that would come in. It was just, it's just a characteristic way humans evolve, it seems, according to linguistics. Uh, and it's again a subject that I'm not very privy to. But um, in Portuguese, the, the B and the M are interchangeable. So, you know, when we say B and M, it's mm, boom. You know, so it's like, a, it's like a nasal M and B that merges from one into the other. So, hmm, you know, that's like a ma and a ba. So when something is sort of exactly, that's exactly right. So when something is said, and then when something is written down, you know, there might be one alphabet used when it's said and one alphabet used when it's written down. So uh, again, uh, what these linguistics experts told me is, you know, mom bain could have been easily could have been mom bain. So with the M and so you know, when I'd look again, and then what I realized is, you know, all these records that I was reading, uh, they were all late 19th century British colonial records, where, you know, the British were again, the, what had happened is by the late 1800s, Britain had, uh, sorry, the power um, uh, within Britain had transferred from the company to the crown. So now it was the government itself and the crown itself under the crown's name, uh, running, uh, whatever, Bombay and India, and the Indian subcontinent in general. And now they suddenly had this whole, you know, this whole colonial uh, overtone to everything where, you know, they were always the masters of, they, they are the masters of their destiny. And they were always meant to have conquered these lands and educated the natives or whatever they say, you know, that became the narrative then. And then they had to create these, some accounts which would make sense as to how this was always destined. So, you know, then uh, they didn't want to attribute the name or the origin of the name to an Indian uh, origin. Uh, so when you read Indian accounts from the, even the 1800s, uh, historians talk about uh, uh, this text called the Muma Devi Purana. And in the Muma Devi Purana, there is the mention of uh, a Rakshas that comes to these lands, these islands in Bombay. And uh, again, there are, they, they call him Mubarak. And there was a Mubarak Khan at this time who came to invade Bombay. Uh, and he was uh, allowed in Khilji's nephew in the 12th century, or the 14th century, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And he had, in the 1300s, he had come to Bombay. And uh, so, you know, this, this uh, the locals conjured up this DT known as Mum Mumba Ai, which would be a counter to Mubarak. So this Mumba Ai uh, was again, uh, you know, was established um, as, as the, the matron DT of the island, which would, who would protect the island from this demon, um, the, the, the a temple was set up uh, uh, under uh, uh, again not at the current place that the Mumbai Devi Temple is at, but it was near the northern end of the fort of Bombay, and uh, yeah, so uh, these uh, mid eighteen mid eighteen hundreds historians they attribute this text because there is textual evidence, and in India it's with, in medieval India at least still up to medieval India, it's very difficult to have actual proof because you know 
in terms of records and recording, you know, it's not something we maintain because everything was oral tradition in India. So it's very difficult to prove it, but here there is some proof where, you know, Mumbai was the matron deity of the island. So again, the link is when the Portuguese first came in 1534 to Bombay, they would have noticed in Bombay, everything is linked to Mumbai. And they would have almost definitely just called it Mumbai. Mm -hmm. So, and when they say Mumbai in their own intonation and accent, it would have sounded like Bombay, and then that would have become Bombay, yeah, which would have become Bombay. And then again, in 96 or 95, you know, it became Mumbai again. So after 400 plus years, you know, the name somehow went round and round and round and came back to the land it belongs to. Now, you know, we talked about a lot about Mumbai history. Would like to something which excites you in the global arena before we go to the AHA question. Whatever. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, we, yeah, we can discuss uh, this. The European history sort of, or global history, which actually brought you towards, uh, to what you're doing today. Am I correct? Absolutely. So, so for me, at least, you know, very early on, I think one of the things that fascinated me was Egyptian um, history, uh, symbology. Again, I think I was very fascinated by the size and scale of, let's say, the pyramids and how the, you know, the Sphinx looked. And, you know, I think a, a lot of that, because, you know, I, I feel that in the early 1900s, when, when one reads the history, there's so many interesting tales of, um, um, you know, these kings and curses and queens and, uh, you know, and, and, and deaths related to, you know, uncovering of untold treasures. So, you know, all the curses and the treasures linked all up together, like an Indiana Jones film, you know, I think it seemed too good to be true. So I think that really fascinated me, at least imagination wise. But in terms of um, uh, history for some time, yes, I think it's like you said, you know, that's the reason I wanted to pursue classical European archaeology, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, this Greek and uh, to some extent Roman uh, civilizations really fascinated me. So Greek particularly. So I went through a phase where I'd read quite a bit into, you know, those aspects also. So that was another, you know, one of those foundational um, times because there's so much written uh, already about it so there's already inf there's so much information one can absorb it actually that's true i mean coming to raiders of the lost ark of course that's uh the the ark which goes to the moses that's the jewish history but uh, apart from other i was just like fascinated by greeks uh greek history the roman of uh, the various kinds the mayan civilization you know that was sort of good even egypt we can talk even the chinese to a lot of civilizations which sort of uh, you know also a very rich in history, of course, and which could motivate. You spoke a lot about what you're doing. So coming to the last question, usually there's always the aha question. Uh, before I go to the aha question, did I miss out anything? You know, we covered a lot of stuff and, uh, you know, you talked a lot about various aspects. It's so difficult to remember all of them. But uh, did, uh, did I miss out anything which you really want to speak about? No, not in particular. I think in terms of, you know, the exhibition itself and the history of Bombay, and again, you know, where my interest in the subject comes, I think we have covered quite a bit already. Yeah, I think that's a, it's in a good place. Come back, come to the last question. You could share moments from your life, specifically within your last few years, where you've been covering up a lot about uh, history, where you can, where you could, you know, speak about uh, uh, any, any sort of experiences that really, you know, bring a smile to your, uh, to your life or anything which you really feel excited about sure so uh, you know again when it's something like this you know when i look back and um it's it's just something very small but for me very fascinating you know this was i i, I think it's about seven to eight years ago you know this is much before i even had this interest which was so specific within bombay history and bombay imagery history uh, where i i was in the us i think i was in new york and uh, you know again even new york has quite a few very nice uh, antiquarian um, shops and dealer uh, and very established dealers also. And I walked into one of these shops and I remember, you know, again, I, I just asked them, what do you have on India? And I think one of these images, the first image that I ever purchased, because again, I just liked looking around and didn't really know much of the first image. And I'm looking at, you know, um, I, I again keep a very hefty database of, you know, all my purchases and everything that I have and, and so and so. And literally the first ever piece that I bought was in New York. And um, it was a it was a very ordinary looking piece. I can sh I can show it to you later if you'd like. But uh, you know, it's 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 nothing fancy. It's nothing um, you know um, um, you know very very aesthetically attractive. But 
you know, what struck me was, you know, I'm looking, it's an image of the VT station. And, you know, what, what really struck me was it, you know, it looked like a complete village scene outside the station. So, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, at the time the VT was built, Bombay was, at the time, I, I didn't know anything about the history in, in, at the time, but, um, you know, it, Bombay was still a town. It was a town, more like a village, like a big village that was about to explode in the in the mid 1800s. That wasn't the case, but that image made it look like it was the case. So, you know, for me, that it just it just it, it just sparked something where I felt could Bombay ever have been like this? Because you know, for me, growing up in such an overcrowded city, and now even more so, you know, that really when I look at that image. Every time I look back at, and I'm sure I'll keep it forever. You know, every time I refer to it, and I'm like, "Wow, my God! Like this is what you know where it all began for me." Like in that sense, it's it's that one particular specific point which I can amazingly pinpoint also at this time. So uh, yeah, that's that's one uh, thing that I can think of right now. A fantastic city to also come across, New York. I think global point, one of the fascinating, one of the greatest cities. I've heard so much. Sadly, I was not able to visit it. But um, it, undoubtedly, New York is something which could change your life. And I mean, that's that's all right. You know, uh, for me, uh, again, you know, being in Ann Arbor and having a lot of family in New Jersey and to some extent New York also, uh, I think I did. I, I think we discussed this briefly, but I did about eight or nine trips uh, to New York uh, during those four or five years that I was in the U.S. And it, you know, it was literally the place I wanted to be. I didn't want to go anywhere but there. I interviewed for all sorts of jobs over there and I got a couple that I, but I, those were jobs that I didn't end up wanting to end up in. And I really wanted something very like, you know, specific, but again, you know, it didn't work out for whatever reason, but that was my number one city. And now if I had to pick, you know, Bombay is my number one city. <laughs> I think I'm a little biased there, but New York has to be hands down my number two city in the world to be in. It's just something different. Truly, I think all uh, cities in America are so full of culture. I think that the whole country resonates with culture, art. It gives a lot of prominence. Uh, so I've not been to a lot of countries, but what was so fascinating and, you know, uh, the Middle Road has a publication that I wrote about my experiences in the, uh, usually it's not ever in the I format, but this publication was taken in exception of the libraries or the monuments of, uh, my libraries I didn't talk about, but so so many museums or, you know, so many other places of art and culture which America is. It's truly fascinating. Right. But I also, you know, sorry, on this bit about libraries, before I forget, um, and since you mentioned it, um, you know, when I go, let's let's say when I do my research, you know, and, and uh, there's very, very, very limited institutions in India that have some materials that I don't have in my collection and I want to look up research such and such. So uh, I, I go to the Asia take and, you know, but the thing is because of Bombay weather, mostly some of it may not be in best condition. So the next step is usually British library. And, you know, when I compare the British library to some of the American libraries that have vast collections and some of them also related to South Asia, um, you know, and I ask them to, you know, how, it, how can I refer to uh, pieces and such. And, you know, it's so much smoother to work with American systems. You know, it's, it's just so, uh, again, you know, there's a whole process that goes into, um, you know, accessing other countries' works, but with the, with the American libraries, it's so smooth, it's so straightforward, it's so professional. And of course, you know, there's there's very little issue, at least when, because we speak in English and we write in English, uh, you know, with the language, there's very little barriers. So with Portugal, that becomes a bit of a barrier, but, uh, you know, America's the best at, at all of this. No doubt. But in Pune, it was just to say, British Library was one of the biggest and I have a very fond memories of going there when I was doing my engineering days and after. Of course, now I think it's closed down. It's 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 become much smaller. I haven't checked up, but uh, it was the main sort of library in Pune, and a very fascinating library for a public library, you know, to go to. So I really appreciate uh, sort of the work which they actually did in Pune. But uh, yeah, so thanks. I really appreciate taking time and speaking with me. I really I really uh, admire the work which you're doing. And I think uh, what's good about uh, is that you've taken it to uh, 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 next level. You know, people have hobbies, they build on it. But what you're doing is like you're taking that particular, uh, you know, your passion to another level where you're actually commercializing it also. And you're able to, so you know, uh, getting a subject matter expertise within that particular uh, area. So I really appreciate We've also gone into certain things which not many people are aware. For example, I was not even aware of so much of history uh, associated with Mumbai. And this is good. This is something which the whole, you know, sort of helps. 
and it's more of a motivating factor for others to understand and uh, you know build on about their their own passion and how they can take it to the next level so yeah I, no, thank you. You know, you said some things which are, you know, very, very interesting. This thing about merging, um, you know, actually making a living out of something that we're passionate about. It's, some, you know, it's usually in India, for some reason, it becomes a dichotomy. You know, it's either this or that, you know. So it's it's true. It's very difficult to do that sometimes. And again, I think we're a little more boxed in our way of thinking as of today. But you're right, like, it, you know, it, and not just important. I also think if you pursue it with that mindset, and you know, there's not. It's nothing to be shy about. It's nothing to be, you know, uh, defensive about. That it's not true enough if you're also pursuing the financial side of things. That comes up sometimes. Even for me myself, it does come up as a question. But I do try and keep both of them going concurrently because it is important. You know, finance and uh, money does drive a lot of uh, our own. You know, it, it. Let's just say it has a place in life. You know, it has a strong place. Yeah, in absolutely, life. absolutely. You know, so that's what uh, the great part is. Like, if you're passionate about. You never get tired even for a day. You don't remember how much you've worked. I think one of the great uh, Einstein answer was that he he never, he forgot to have lunch because he actually never had time to think about it because you're so yes. about what you're doing. And commercial and financial aspect is very important because if you're making a living out of it, then, you know, you will actually do better. You, you are going to be very involved in what you're doing. And uh, you have all the right to sort of earn and make fruits of what you're doing. So that's the holistic part is like you do what you really love and you take it to the next level. And of course, that's one of the great part also what I've seen in the US or in the Europe is like yes. yeah, something we should learn from. Right. Absolutely right. And and that's how you get some of the best people in the world where you're working. So not only what I'm saying is that's one of the philosophies. Of course, it happens anywhere in the world. But right. But, they... no, but on the same point, you know, the, the one thing I would leave most uh, our viewers, listeners, whoever is, is logging in, you know, the thought I would leave them with is, you know, try and pursue something that, you know, your genuine curiosity takes you towards. You know, many times what happens is, let's say, even for me, sometimes if I'm good at something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you love it or you're really into it, or it's just a natural inclination. Like you said, you know, you don't even realize how much time and effort you put in because it comes so naturally, it's a part of you. So try and tend to go towards, I think that's one generally important thought, uh, you know, I would leave, leave, leave people with. Thanks. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you all the very, so keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for this time.